one thing that has been utterly consistent uh, in all my interviews with agentic schools is that who's there matters because it changes how the school is moving forward. You know, one of the things I think is just fundamental to being an agent, supporting the agency of learners and teachers, staff or whatever you want to call them, uh, is even if it's the same people, tomorrow they're different. You know, it, it, you know, it trans we're humans and we transform over time. And I think that's a valuable feature, not a bug. <laughs> that's where I think that this, the, the universities do look for self-direction things up because it, you know the, what they're looking for is somebody who knows themselves well enough to take advantage of what they have to offer. You could, um, also, you could al also almost say that the inverse mm. is true of the traditional system. Who's there doesn't matter. It's right, going right. to be the same system no matter who's there. Well, you, <laughs> the, the, the standardization. And, and, and that's exactly what a lot of the, the, that work has done is like even at the university level, we're, we're all going to have the same requirements. You know, we're going to have Carnegie units. We're going to have, you know, the, yeah. the type of standardization was, you know, just incredible. And it, and it, it the university system demanded it of the K-12 system. That's the, you know, the committee of 10 back in 1890, you know, said, we want Carnegie units and we want seat time and we want, <laughs> and it demanded those things. And then all the high schools just went along with it. Yeah. They're, the, they're the experts. They know, right? But now I think it's, it's, the, the, it's, it's going to flip or it has flipped or it's in the process of flipping where schools with self-directed learners are going to be making different demands of what higher education needs to be. And higher education is in a very interesting point because of the, in, in the U.S., in particular, costs are super high, you know, debt. And, and so people are rethinking, like, wait a minute. <laughs> um, and, and, and schools are crashing at the lower end. Like we had Merrillhurst University here in, in just down the street here flopped a few years ago. And I think that there's, I mean, we had another one too, but, but there's a whole bunch of things that things are transforming and it's not quite as neat as like the release of an iPhone and suddenly everything changes. Um, I, I think it's, it's what we're doing in terms of what I call agentic schools, democratic schools, learner-centered, learner-directed, is that that is on the rise. Um, it, it, I wouldn't say it's commanding force yet, but I think it's going in the direction that, that is necessary and it's going well, to change everything. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Burr. Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools vodcast. Uh, I am here with uh, Jerry Mintz and Peter Berg, no relation to me uh, that we know of. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they are of the Alternative Education Resource Organization, usually known as Arrow, uh, with the infamous website of educationrevolution.org, which I love. Um, so I like to start off the, with storytelling. So. Tell me a story, and I give you each a chance to do this. Tell a story of someone who really plugged into Arrow and and got great value out of plugging in and 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 figuring things out, and just just really took advantage of what Arrow has to offer. Okay, Peter, do you want to do? That? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I would I would look at. Um, I actually just visited um, North Star, which is part of the Liberated mm -hmm. Learners Network. Um, and I visited them last week and they are located in Sunderland, Massachusetts. Mm. And they are basically a self-directed, you know, center for teens. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Ken Danford, who is, uh, say, the director of North Star, I think has utilized Arrow in, in a lot of different ways. I think for, for inspiration, but I also think for consultation. And I mm -hmm. think for a constant kind of just having a community, I think really, mm. you know, having a community to rely on, 
ha knowing that you have a group of people who feel the same way, maybe not in exactly the same way, but at least they understand that, you know, conventional education, there's a lot of, there's issues with it, there's problems with it. And, you know, isn't there a better way to do things? And so I would, I would point to him as an example. I mean, there are a lot of others, but that's just recent mm -hmm. because um, I was just visiting with Ken last week. Right on, right on. Well, you know, I first met Ken, I think it was the first time I met him, when, they, when Mary Loya, who was the founder of the free school, had a meeting at her family home in Massachusetts. Uh, and at that point, he thought maybe he was going to start a charter school. Mm. You know, he was a regular public school teacher, wasn't sure what he was going to do. Um, and then, you know, there was a lot of interaction and eventually he started uh, something that I, I consider one of the most important innovations and models uh, for educational alternatives. Mm -hmm. And that is the Homeschool Resource Center. And it's been a model for a lot of other people doing similar things. And they've physically helped to start some other ones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, the, I was... Uh... The Open Road Learning Community Learning Center right here uh, that Alan Burns started. Uh, I was on their board for a while, uh, helped them through their process. In fact, the business organization, Deeper Learning Advocates, is it was transmogrified from a school. It's still school alternatives, I think officially, but that was a Liberated Learners uh, program. Um, so, 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 yeah, I, I think that's a, a great example because you know we're all connected in one way or another. Um, so, so very give us often, a little, very but, often we don't know who oh, gets yeah. from us and then goes ahead and is inspired and starts something. We don't hear about it sometimes forever or till a lot later when they right, need something. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that's, that's a really great, um, you know, recommendation for the, 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 the approach that you've taken is sort of, create a community, but, but really have, uh, you know, you're holding on loosely, so to speak, uh, you know, just really allowing people provide a public resource and, and let people plug in to the degree that they want. You have Dan, Ken, Dan, you know, Dan Danforth, uh, ooh, Ken, uh, who, who, you know, really plugs in, really takes advantage. Um, but then it is beautiful to also realize that there are people who just sort of, you know, bounce off the edge and, but, but still go create something wonderful and, 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 you know, still, still it's magic. In fact, um, you know, I go to a lot of conferences, um, that are not, <laughs> are, you know, democratic schools or even, even, you know, Montessori or anything, you know, I've been some very mainstream, uh, conferences and, and people are familiar with Arrow, you know? <laughs> um, and, and so, and so they'll say they're inspired by, but they're not directly connected to, um, but I, I, even then I also su am surprised at how few people, um, even are ignorant of of the democratic school movement as a whole uh like they've just never heard of it so it's it's an interesting you know like if we, we've got a great community but we also you know got to build more visibility <laughs> well, we, you know my background and arrow is probably most expert has the most expertise in democratic education but we go beyond that and yeah. the commonality we talk about is a learner-centered approach yeah, which goes yeah. way beyond democratic and it can be Montessori, it can be Waldorf, it can be you know, homeschooling and so on. As long as the basic thought is you're going to build on the interest of the student rather than do an imposed top down type curriculum. Right, right. And I, I would even say that some people call that learner directed, you mm -hmm. know, and we've used learner centered because it's it's a little more encompassing, but um, but some people would say, oh, that's learner directed because the learner is really driving, you know, what's happening. And I think that's where we kind of fall in is that, like Jerry said, you know, we're inclusive of anyone who really wants to get behind that idea mm -hmm. and, you know, wants to try it out, wants to whatever, you know, wants to engage with it. And that's, that's the key to all of it really is that, you know, it's about the learners. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of great philosophies out there and a lot of great kind of ways to do things. But if, if that's at the center, that's a, to us, that makes the, that's what makes the difference. Right. Like you were yeah. talking about going to some things that are in mainstream, 
it's not that way, right? It's not learner right. directed. It's not even learner centered, right? It's not anything about it. It's about, and maybe, you know, it's learner centered to the degree, well, you have an IEP, you have an IEP, right? And those are fine. And those are, those are, there's nothing wrong with that, but, but that's still not learner centered. It's basically saying, mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. here's what you need to do in order to work well in a conventional system. <laughs> like, right. That, right. That's, that's what a lot of those things do. And, and, Again, you know, it doesn't mean that students shouldn't get support. It just means that when you're doing it from a learner directed approach, it's a whole different set of things that you're working with. Let me give you an example. When I was uh, mm -hmm. just visiting uh, North Star last week, and, what, and one of the students said to me that it's really there where, you know, when they're there, they're not, they're not forced to go to classes, right? They're not forced to do that. You know, there's a schedule of things that you can learn about, but they're not forced. And one of the things student, and I'm paraphrasing here is basically that because of that, they're learning so much more because mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're engaged in things that they really want to know about and they really want to learn about. And even from there, they've realized that they have other interests. Right. So, so it's that kind of idea or starting from that standpoint of being learner directed. Yeah. And that's, that's where some of my, uh, uh, I have a new book out. Um, and, and so really trying to bridge between that, you know, learner directed, learner centered, teacher centered and saying, okay, there's a, there's a spectrum there. Um, but are, are there ways to really, you know, dig deeper and, 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 and have an understanding of there are ways that teacher centered is fine, you know, under certain circumstances, but what are those circumstances? <laughs> you know? um, and, and so that's, that's an interesting challenge. Um, and, and that's where I think the, the recognizing, like, like having the openness to say, if you're learner centered, that's great. Let's, let's talk. Um, and, and then, and then trying to find what is it that brings us together, what really unifies our practice um, and being clear about, you know, learner centered versus learner directed. Um, both are great, um, but there's something. And, and then my work is really getting at really understanding what are the, as long as we're supporting the students and, and the teachers then what does that look like? Um, and, and it will be an interesting empirical question as to how teacher centered how well supported is that um it it may not work very well for five-year-olds <laughs> uh, but it works differently for 18 year olds you know uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't agree with that of course uh and the reason why i don't agree with this i think five-year-olds are more aware of the fact that they should be controlling their education than 18 year olds mm. and they do in fact right right and, and I, I remember once when there was a school that we had helped to start in New Jersey mm -hmm. and they wanted me to come over there and uh, talk about democratic process. Mm. <clears throat> and so I was driving over and then all of a sudden it occurred to me, hey, wait, the oldest person there is five years old. Right. So am I gonna, I'm probably gonna have to give them the curriculum and whatever mm -hmm. the agenda, <clears throat> whatever. And I got there and I'm walking in and there's one kid screaming, mommy, and walking in, I said, oh, wow, what am I gonna do? And then they are all sitting at a table. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, there's a couple of basic reasons why you might want to have a democratic process in a school like this. And one uh, is that um, you want to discuss something that might be a problem in the school. Another is something that might be good for the school to do. All the hands went up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and instantly we had our agenda. One girl said that she'd heard that there was a problem with chocolate that it had a caffeine like thing in it. And therefore probably kids shouldn't have it after noon. Mm. <laughs> she was four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and another, uh, so, so this, this is the kind of thing. Yeah. They, they got the idea immediately. Right. 
I think young kids do absolutely get it. It makes sense to them. That's how yeah. they've been learning up to that point. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's um, that's one of those things that 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 even within our communities, there's there's um, interesting challenges around understanding what are the limits of it, and and what, you know, is there an age? I don't think the age is particularly relevant. Um, not really. Uh, and and so figuring out where, like the the challenge for a lot of democratic schools is identifying who they serve. Um, because there isn't a specific demographic, there isn't a specific, you know, typical label for, I, I've asked this of many of the people I've interviewed, like, oh, who do you serve? <laughs> and, and most of the time, it's a, well, we don't really have a, have a specific way to describe them. Um, and then they'll talk about the diversity in their community, whether it's socioeconomic or racial or, or ethnic or cultural or, you know, um, is that there? There is quite a bit of, of variation in amongst the people, but but that I think that speaks to how um, universally applicable giving kids and teachers to facilitate the freedom to self to self direct their learning actually is. Is it? it it's hard to describe who's there because it's so universal. Um, so so. Talk about some of the ways some of the ways that Arrow, besides having a website where people can do resources, talk about some of the programs and things that you're doing to build the network, to build out the visibility of the movement. Well, of course, <clears throat> we have an annual conference. Right. That's going to be coming up in June 21st to 23rd. Peter's um, basically coordinating that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, people come from all over to that conference. Uh, and so that's one of our things. Another is for people who want to start new alternatives, we have an online course. Mm -hmm. And we have helped start over 100 schools that we know of. I mean, there's probably a, a hundreds, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, schools and programs. You say school, we kind of change the name. It used to be school starters. Now it's alternative starters because yeah. an awful lot of them are homeschool resource centers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons for that is there's more freedom uh, for people who are homeschoolers than there are for people starting schools in mm -hmm. many states and countries. Yeah. Yeah. So the easiest way is to say we're a homeschool resource center. You know, there's really at this point hardly any difference. Yeah. Uh, and so. That's another thing that we do. We do networking. We put people together, uh, who, sometimes very often introducing people in their same communities that didn't yeah. know each other. We do that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so basically we, we promote the idea of, of this approach to education. And really it's just getting back to the way People learn, I think. Yeah, I yeah. think that we use the paradigm that children and people are are natural learners mm -hmm. and uh, build on that rather than say, oh, we have all the answers you're going to need to be uh, successful in life. Just, you know, listen to us and then regurgitate it on the tests. So, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah, I would, I would add to... A lot of what Jerry just said, of course, he mentioned the conference and that'll be in Minneapolis this year. So we're in you know, the middle of the country, so everyone will have access to it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we like to do at the conference is, of course, you know, we have a schedule of activities. We have a schedule of presentations and and all of that. But I think really the main the main hub, the backbone of the conference is the networking and the mm -hmm. conversations that pop up and and. You know, even just, um, you know, people kind of get together at the conference and say, hey, I'm interested in this and hey, I'm interested in this, too. And then, you know, some of them have developed friendships that have lasted decades, you know, because mm -hmm. because they've met at the conference or they they wound up working together or they started, like Jerry said, homeschool resources, schools, organizations. Even there's uh, a few organizations that are in existence now that really got their start at an arrow conference. Yeah. Um, so so I think there's that. And then we also are working really closely with people who want to start alternatives. So, uh, you know, we're targeting a couple of areas 
and we're really, you know, working a little bit more of the um, kind of in-person boots on the ground idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the course can do a lot and there's a lot that, um, that, that people can get from the course. This takes it a little bit of, uh, gives it another layer to it. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of that in-person, you know, um, doing visits, but also doing consultations. Um, we just got asked by a couple of folks who want some help you know, with doing their 5013C application. Oh, right, yeah. So, so things like that, I think that people look at us for resources and, um, you know, but again, you know, like Jerry mentioned, the networking, but it's also, again, you know, making uh, connections, building relationships, bringing people together, you know, getting the word out. We have social media presence, you know, we have, uh, we actually have a webinar series, which uh, we'll be rebooting next week. Mm -hmm. um, Jerry just did a podcast. So, so it's a lot of ways that we reach out and get the word out and uh, and get people plugged in. Um, we also we met with um, some folks that are working out of the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education, and mm -hmm. they're working on a program to uh, to basically get paid internships into schools, mm -hmm. uh, into schools that can take uh, take advantage of that kind of idea. There's a little yeah. bit more to it than that, but that's kind of the the overall crux of it. And so we, we, we work with a lot of different, um, you know, uh, people or individuals who are dialing into this kind of learner, this learner directed idea and, and, um, you know, really looking at how to advance that. So, so we do a lot of, there's a lot of, so just ten, uh, you know, tentacles, I would say that, you know, go off of mm -hmm. the uh, things that we're doing. So. Right on. So right a couple, on. More, couple more things is we put out a weekly free e newsletter. Oh, right on. And that goes to 15,000 people every week. Mm -hmm. to give them the latest news of what's going on in educational alternatives around the world. People send job ads to us, uh, they, they send an announcements of special activities that they're having. And so on. So it's used for this kind of general networking. Mm -hmm. uh, and also we have the number one website in for in alternative education on Google. Right on. Uh, and so people write to me. I get about, about 100 emails a day from people who are writing to me from the website. Uh, mm -hmm. So these are some of the things that we do. Right on. Right on. And and is your are you entirely membership supported or have you do you have like uh you know a network of I mean I know you have member schools, uh individual members, uh and, and I, I think I recall you might have gotten some grant funding. Um what's your what's your kind of you know overall business model? <laughs> all, all, all of that. We basically yeah. our business model is we get the money from where we can. Uh -huh. <laughs> so people do have memberships. They do pay for memberships. But if people can't afford memberships, we still find a way to get them involved, mm -hmm. uh, especially people from uh, developing countries and things right. like that. Uh, so we have people all over the world who are joining. And, yeah, if they can afford it's very cheap to begin with anyway, right. uh, but, but it's a hundred dollars for the year, you know, and among other things, if you're a school, for example, or organization, uh, and you have memberships and people pay for that. Well, just think about it. You know, uh, if you're, we link to you from our member page. Right. So if you're like an independent alternative school and you get one student who's going to pay $25,000 for the year, uh, you're set for the next century or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and so that's um, it's one of the ways we do it. Another is we do, do get some grants. Peter just got a grant from a foundation for us, and we've done that. We don't do that too often. We haven't done much mm -hmm. of that. Uh, and but but the, that this is nice. And uh, we also get support from people who go to our conferences right right you know and uh so these are some of the ways that uh you know that we keep going right on yeah right on. and um 
I would, you know, we also have sustainers, um, which is kind of a different type of, a little bit of different type of membership. Uh, right. We do have sponsors, you know, people who uh, actually uh, Antioch University is one of our sponsors. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's different layers of sponsorship, um, which if anybody's interested, they can contact us and we can uh, take them through the different layers. But basically sponsorship gets you, you know, banners on our, our website and our conference mm -hmm. site. Um, it gets you consultations with us, you know, registration at the comp, you know, again, there's a lot of different tiers, so I don't want to go into all of it, but it matters. Right, right. There's, um, there's that way as well. And like Jerry said, the conference, um, you know, is something, you know, we try to keep, um, costs as low as we can. So as many people as possible can access the conference and we do, you know, we work with people who, you know, need a different rate for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do try to generate a, you know, at least some amount of revenue from the conference as well. Right, um, right. and then again, you know, like Jerry said, this, the, the, the alternative starters course and, uh, we're actually working on uh, some new courses coming up and things like that. So, so it's just a lot of, I think that to diversify the model and, and, you know, have as many revenue streams as you can. And mm -hmm. I would say that's what we encourage any alternative that's going to right. get started is to really diversify, right. To get out there and yeah, tuition is great. And that, that's, uh, that's a great thing, but, but there's also, um, other things. And I think that's a really big issue right now is the sustainability mm -hmm. of alternatives. And I know that's, right. we're actually going to have a, a whole panel on that um, mm -hmm. at the conference. And we do have individual workshops that are kind of addressing that as right, well. Right. So let's just add a few more. For example, we have a bookstore. And right, right. We sell, we sell books and we sell things from the bookstore. And um, I do consultations that goes to support Arrow. Uh, mo a lot of the times people would just call up and we'll, I'll tell them what I know before <laughs> we make it into a concert. Right, right. Oh, that's it. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm happy to do that because our we're a nonprofit. Right. Uh, and so, as Peter said, people do donate to us. We do have these sustainers, about 75 or so, that give something every month. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, sustainers actually get into the conferences uh, free. Right on. Uh, and uh, so, so yeah, we have a lot different ways that we manage to uh, to keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, th I think it's actually, um, you know, so so the first Aero conference I went to, the first three were here in Portland <laughs> uh, because that was that's you know home base for me. Um, uh, but then, you know, uh, came all the way to New York this last year. So that was that was really wonderful. Um, but I think that, that it's really uh, your bookstore is a particularly uh, interesting resource uh, because it is covering such a, a, a an interesting niche in education. Um, yeah, cause there it, are a it's, lot of books and things that we have that nobody else has. Exactly, exactly. It doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. And and I think that's a really valuable thing that that may get overlooked sometimes, um, and and it becomes really obvious when when you know you're actually at the conference and you can see the table of books and you go wow okay, <laughs> um, I think that's a really nice uh, aspect of it. Um, now one of the things is, so, I presume on your panel you'll have uh, uh, there's kind of a new organization in the last few years the Vila Fund. Um, which is a, I believe it's part of Stand Together. Is that, I think that's yes, right. Um, that's and so there's an interesting um, attention being given to micro schools. And of course, most of the schools in your, in that, that are associated with Arrow would be considered micro schools, I think. Um, and so I think, so that points to a kind of uh, some ways that we're building some visibility and starting to get some, some uh, philanthropic dollars to pay attention, which I think is a valuable uh, uh, part of the picture is there a, is there sort of a, a a political side to the work you do? Well, I think that's a really good point, and and, and the answer is not really no. Mm. Uh, I would say that what we do cuts across the whole spectrum, mm. and that is the funny thing because a lot of times I'll be talking to someone who is from one political background or, or another. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'll say something and they'll be startled. <laughs> but 
they always thought, well, this is right along the lines of what I believe. But what the fact is that there's a commonality here between the different uh, wings. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the fact is that what we're talking about is learning and kids and education right. and not a particular political agenda. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it's one of the things I so so I did my thesis research about twelve years ago now. Um, but one of my two sites were Village Free School and Village Home Education Resource Center, um, and it was really interesting talking with particularly the Village Home group. You know, Lori, uh, Lori McKee, I think. Anyway, <laughs> Lori, uh, um, is I asked about you know kind of the diversity of the group and and homeschooling in its deeper past was really associated with conservatism in a, in a, in a strong way. Um, but that has certainly changed over time. Um, yeah. But it is interesting because the homeschool groups tend to be much more politically diverse than other types of groups that come together. Yeah. Um, and so that was an interesting, um, you know, aspect of, of insight in, in, in the homeschool resource center. Um, well, I tell you something about that. It's very interesting. Uh, so, the origins of modern homeschooling have a lot to do with Christian education. Right. right. Uh, and so the thought would be, well, that would really not be the kind of homeschooling we're talking about. But the funny thing is this. I remember I was on a train mm. and there was this kid who was talking to the, all the adults there and talking about what he does and what he's learning in education and so on. And then I found out, well, he was a Christian a homeschooler mm -hmm. so i had to ask him so what do you think uh about evolution mm -hmm. and he gave me kind of a stock answer right a god would not have whatever something or other but about five minutes later he said to me but you know i have thought about this and looked into it a lot myself and i believe there is evolution within a species mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well he was already beyond the pale i don't think he realized it but he was <laughs> <laughs> this he was thinking for himself, you see, which is right. what we're really talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would. I mean, I would. I would say, in terms of like what we're seeing now, right? I think with the the a lot of attention on, you know, let's just say school choice and you know mm -hmm. uh, educational alternatives, and and yeah, I think there are certain groups that. Um, you know, are trying to leverage this in a political way. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say, but, but Arrow is not really about that. I mean, what we're about is, you know, Jerry mentioned cutting across the spectrum and, you know, we just, again, it's that idea of being learner directed. Right. And it's really behind that. And, and yes, you know, things, I think everything now is politicized, right? I don't think you could have a conversation about a piece of candy without, you know, somebody's <laughs> going to make it into something political, you know, but, um, so I think so. So there, that that is happening, and you mentioned Vela and Stand Together, and I think there's 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 funding and there's a policy even following some of this stuff. And I think the at the end of the day, you know, we don't like Jerry, Jerry mentioned earlier. We don't want to say we have the right thing for you. Do it this right. way. What we what we are encouraging is saying, hey, you can make an alternative. You can do this. Where mm -hmm. where we for us to get behind it, it needs to be really this learner directed idea. But after that, you're really kind of free to do this, how you want to do it. Right. And it's really, and so we're not going to tell you how to do it, uh, you know, or who you should be aligned with politically or, or not be aligned with or whatever. That's, that's not really about that. And, and arrow has always been able to work with, you know, whatever, you know, kind of movement is happening at the time. There was a while, for a while where there was sort of a movement against alternatives, right? And right. there was kind of a pushback against that. And that's happening a little bit now. Like you see sort of the movement, like there's a lot of attention, but there's also some groups really trying to push back hard on that. And that's never really affected, you know, what we've been able to do because we've always mm -hmm. been able to work individually and say, okay, this is what your state has. This is how you can work with that. Here's what you can do. Um, it's not, some states obviously are more friendly to it than others, but. I want to say, Peter, I just realized, actually, well, I do disagree with you. 
and you keep on trying to correct me, and now I realize I don't agree with you. So <laughs> you keep on making it be learner-directed, and I say learner-centered, mm -hmm. and there is a difference. And the difference is learner-directed is narrower. Right. It's small. It's learner-directed. That's democratic education, not necessarily all of homeschooling, Right. Not necessarily Waldorf, not necessarily some of Montessori, but they're all part of our network. And the whole idea is as long as it's learner centered, based on the interest of, of the student, it isn't necessarily run by them. Some right. of it is. So actually, I realize I disagree with you on that. Yeah, I think so. It's an important point. I think you're talking more about governance and not so much no, the learning. No, it's I, I, it, it not just governance. I mean, that well, would so, be and stuff but i'm talking about individuals too right and so and i know we we've, we've talked about this and some of the things that we landed on in learner directed is that so again the learning is is directed by the learner it's not so much how the school runs so mm -hmm. to speak right or, or it could be that i mean there there could be elements of that like you were mentioning you know waldorf and montessori and and so it's yeah there's a there's a a curriculum right there's kind of there's a structure but in terms of learner, it being learner directed, they are direct. After a brief interruption, I, I was just saying about like Montessori and Waldorf, and yeah, there's a structure, um, but it's learner directed in the sense that they are they're making decisions about what they do. So that's yeah. I think the thing about learner directed is is more it's about oh. making decisions about your learning, not so much about you know how things run around you. All right, so let me let me try to clarify that again. Uh, so so for example, let's just take uh, Montessori. There are choices that kids make, so that's part of Montessori. But if they're limited to certain areas, so that's it's really not learner directed in that sense. It's directed by the teachers who set up the situation, and then there are choices within it. So that's why I still keep on going back to learner-centered. It's still a, a certain philosophy, but it's not necessarily all the decisions may be made by the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to because my field is psychology, um, part of what I've been teasing out in my writing and things is trying to understand. So the, the foundation is, um, learners have needs that need to be met and they're not going to learn well if those needs aren't met so the fundamental criticism of the mainstream is that those learner needs are clearly being undermined not just neglected not just ignored but undermined and so as i've looked at the spectrum of alternatives and saying okay and, and even some mainstreams who claim to be very learner centered is looking okay well is the are the needs being met there and 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 how would i know that um and and it's interesting because there's a difference like like you can talk about the individual's needs being met but then you, when you talk about the group people can have varying levels of whether their needs are met or not <laughs> and so so that's where it's a really interesting challenge to think about um in particular are there governance structures collective decision-making patterns and conflict resolution as part of that, that are better at meeting needs across a group than others. And I think that that's where you kind of get into this challenge of, of learner directed is a, is from my perspective sort of, well, we're gonna give the learner the most autonomy we can in order, because autonomy is one of those needs. Um, and so the organ, when you, use learner directed, you're trying to say, okay, we're gonna put autonomy maximally on the child, and then we're going to create an environment in which that is optimized. But you can also say that that um, there's, there's ways that you could run the decision-making that's not necessarily learner directed, but maybe learner centered in the sense that we're gonna make sure your needs are met. Uh, we're gonna focus on, <clears throat> pardon me, focus on relatedness, we're gonna focus on your competence, and we're going to create an environment that that may not be as autonomy supportive, but it's gonna be autonomy supportive in the psychological sense, 
but it's not necessarily going to give you every choice possible. Um, and, and particularly about building competence in the world, it's part of that, um, which is also the three needs are, and you're probably familiar with this, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Um, and so, so it's been interesting to me to look at and sort of think about how do you distinguish these environments? And a lot of it, I, I think that learner-centered and learner-directed are probably not specific enough <laughs> uh, because you're, you're foundationally, in order for the good learning to happen, you have to meet their needs. And then the question is, how many different ways can you do that? And, and I think the interesting question is, what are the ways, what are the ways of organizing the space that can maybe do that better than others and and it may i think it can be done many different ways thus you can have something like uh, uh you know a democratic school where there's a most autonomy but you still have to acknowledge the fact that they're in a group they have to get along with others mm -hmm. they have to make decisions and resolve conflicts because <laughs> making decisions often results in conflicts but you have but that's that's the point is is that you can organize that in different ways um and and that can look different different ways and then that's i think the beauty of while you understand learner directed learner centered but you're going to be, include everybody mm, that's pretty good <laughs> yeah i you know in terms of you know meeting students needs and and so so i think there's a few things here right i think that when, when we look at i think sometimes when people hear learner directed or especially when they hear the term self-directed Right. right. It seems like this very selfish kind of, you know, me, me, me centered kind of thing. And to me, it's really the antithesis of that. Right. Yeah. It's about, yeah, it's meeting your need in the sense that, um, you know, we're, like you were pointing out, we're giving your autonomy to learn and we're, and we're trusting you to make decisions and we're doing and we're and, and we're, we're operating in a certain way that honors who you are. You're, you're seen, you're heard, um, you know, your basic needs are, are met. Um, right you know, that kind of thing. But the, like, you know, even when, when you're, when you're coming at it from a learner directed, self-directed learner centered, how, however we want to kind of spin this around, it's really about you. You're still interacting, right? You're still right. interacting with the community in some way, whether you're doing it online, whether you're doing it in person, it, it, it kind of, you know, it doesn't matter in that way in the sense that you're still, you still have to interact. You're still, you're even in some ways more accountable, right? Not right. less accountable, right? When you have that level of autonomy and choice and you, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're directing things. And even if it, you know, if it's, if it's learner centered and, you know, things are centered on you and we're making decisions that we think are the best for you. And yeah, maybe you have a say, maybe you don't, but still you have, it's, you almost have more accountability in that, those types of systems rather than, okay, come in, take this test. Here you go. You're out. All oh, you know, kids in the class didn't pass the test. Well, it must be the teacher's fault, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's almost like taking the accountability away in some way, right? So, so I just, I think it's interesting when we when we talk about it because there is that kind of idea sometimes when people hear it. Well, that means you know no one's <laughs> going to learn everything, anything, and they're just going to be like it's going to be a free for all, and they're just going to be doing whatever they want. And right, right, yeah, maybe, but the doing what they want is the learning, right? Is part of what they're doing. It's part of what they're engaging with. And yeah, I mean, from a psychological standpoint, you know, and I even think about William Glasser and his ideas right. and, you know, and that kind of thing. And it's, and yeah, there, you know, there's, there's, there's certainly needs that need to be met. I think that, yeah, you could have a certain structure, like even in a democratic school, I was part of a democratic school, you know, every year that kind of shifts a little bit. I mean, you have right. sort of the fundamental kind of things that, you know, the, how the school operates, so to speak, and you have how the meeting operates, but still every single year or sometimes even during the year, right? Those mm -hmm. things change because this is a different community now, right? There's different needs that we need to address. There's different things that need to go on. Um, so, so I, yes, I do think that that's, those things help shape how you meet the needs of the students. Right, right. So ultimately, we would like to see this whole school system mm -hmm. uh, get back to an approach that really meets the needs of students, mm -hmm. really listens to them, really lets them help make decisions about their own education and their life. 
Yep. And this seems to be on the increase. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that was interesting is when the pandemic came along, uh, all of a sudden, people had to figure out, wait, what, how, what are we going to do? And they kind of grabbed some of the models that we had set up. Mm -hmm. That is the so distance learning, the micro schools. Uh, a lot of this was there for them. The models were there. We'd been creating them over 30 years time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I think that 2 billion people around the world all of a sudden realized they weren't necessarily beholden to go to that local assigned school. That's right, yeah. This is revolutionary. This may be the education revolution in itself. And it's something that's changing over time. It doesn't happen instantly. But all of a sudden, people everywhere came to know, oh, wait, I have choices. And so that'll be very interesting to see where it goes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that, that um, a lot of focus being put on the micro schools and, and uh, because it because, you know, so many people just kind of plugged right into, you know, one way or another, <laughs> either homeschooling or micro schooling really fast. Um, and and so I think, you know, you've got things like Acton and, and Prinda and, and these other things that sort of popped up as ways to propagate a model of micro schooling. Um, and, and so it's, I think it's interesting that that's, that that has really exploded. Um, you've, you've got the school choice people all jumping in and piling on. And, um, and so, yeah, I think it's a really interesting moment um, to see how, how can, can it become more embedded societally for one, but also then are there, are there ways that it can infiltrate into the system, so to speak, um, and you know, I've, I've got uh, my friend Matt Beck up in in uh, Washington is is trying to start a public. Uh, you know, he's been a public school teacher his whole career, um, and trying to start something very learner centered in in a public school setting. He's not there yet, but he's made you know a lot of connections, and and so he represents kind of a vanguard of sort of okay, can this infiltrate into even the the mainstream uh, to some degree? Um, and so I think that's really an interesting challenge um. i think that students and parents may try to demand more of this too and that yeah, may yeah. push it in a certain direction well that, that's exactly the momentum that, that matt is trying to t kind of build on um it's not just you know he got connected with uh, education reimagined and that's where i met him um and and kind of got connected and said okay you know let's see how you can do this um and so, yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting um, that so many parents realize things are not. In, in fact, there was uh, one of the foundations put out a report recently, basically, you know, big national representative sample kind of thing, um, where, where, where the overwhelming sensibility among parents is not what we've done before. <laughs> they don't know what they want exactly, but they know they don't want the mainstream what, model right right mm -hmm. and, and you know think about it, it culturally um you've got this whole idea oh kids don't like to go to school they should they and so on and yet psychologically we know that kids are natural learners right uh and if you've ever watched a two-year-old three-year-old i mean <laughs> they're insatiable Oh, they yeah. want to learn everything they possibly can. And so if those two ideas don't seem to go together, except in the sense of looking at the fact that this, if the kids don't like school, something's wrong with their school. Right, exactly. Yeah, it, you know, it's uh, it's it's interesting because I, I, I think like we're, we've been discussing, there's a lot of interest now. And right. like Jerry's saying, right, there's a, there's demand, uh, you, you know, like you pointed out, you know, parents are saying, oh, I don't, I don't necessarily know what, but I know not this, right? Mm -hmm. I know this isn't working. And so I, so it's a really interesting time. I also been kind of keeping my eye on and been having 
uh, conversations with others about, you know, it tends when things like this happens, you get tons of pop-ups, right? Tons right. of, tons of new things pop up. And then after a while, those things sort of fade a little bit because for a number of reasons, mostly it's sustainability, right? But a lot of times it's because it's not based on solid philosophical ground or, you know, sometimes it's just like trying to take advantage of a wave mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's not necessarily, we don't necessarily really have this thought out. Um, maybe um, we just wanted to do it for a short while. You know, that, that happens sometimes too. Some, sometimes, you know, people get involved and they just want to be involved for a short time and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, so really interesting to see in the next three, five years, you know, where this is going to be and, and, mm -hmm. you know, what's going to emerge because, you know, for a long while, Arrow was, uh, you know, if not the only one, one of the few yeah. organizations that were, were doing this and promoting and doing all this. And now there's more, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. well, you um, know, reality is going to affect this. Mm -hmm. The reality of being in the new millennium uh, is that people need to be entrepreneurial. They're going to need to be entrepreneurial to survive. Right. It's, it can't be like, oh, you just plug into this field and then you're set for life. Everything changes. People will be changing jobs. Jobs will be disappearing as right. they're replaced by other technologies and so on. So it's reality that's going to have an, a, a, a probably more effect on this than anything else. Yeah, the fact yeah. That in this millennium, we can't take the approach that people were taking a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Kerry McDonald has been really focused on micro schools and and sort of the entrepreneurial side of of the opportunities to get things started. And so I think it's really. Um, you know, that, that that's landing in this space, in this alternative space in a new way, uh, you know, because of the the these pop things that have now popped up just in the last few years. Um, I mean, the things I think were that that are really taking off at this point are things that have a history pre pandemic and then pandemic hits and then they were, were in a position to grow. Um, and I, and I think that's an interesting uh, aspect of the whole of looking at looking at education as a market, not in a purely financial sense, but as a market in terms of of there's, you know, people looking at how things work. How do I get my kids? You know, I've got a job and I got to send my kids somewhere. You know, what's it going to be? Um, another, and, thing, another thing related to that is. What's the role of college going to be going uh, ongoing? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. It seems less and less relevant mm -hmm, to right. what students are doing, and, it, and and now they're trying to change, but will they change fast enough? What will they change to to right, be? Right. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, more and more and more people are questioning this automatic thing that used to be there is you're going to go to college. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's it's. Um, looking at how, w w as these models that are more learner-centered and learner-directed in particular, um, is that's going to create a demand at that next level? Is, is this is all, you know, I'm, we primarily focus on K-12. And, and, and so what does that, that college level look like when you start having these people who are self-directed, are subject, are they going to demand, you know, traditional college or are they going to demand you know better opportunities to start something or better opportunities to be an entrepreneur or better opportunities to who knows what um but i think as as the learner director learner centered stuff grows that's going to change the demand for college and and we have no way of knowing what that's you know how it's going to change um, i have felt that goddard college's low residency program mm was a good model mm -hmm. and a number of colleges are following it where they go on campus for about 10 days right right there are the teachers meet the other students design independent studies and then go home and do them yeah however yeah. goddard got to the point where even that wasn't particularly financially sustainable mm -hmm. and yeah. i'm not sure what they're going to be doing you know yeah. but i think the model makes some sense yeah yeah and i would say um you know working in universities and and all i think i think we're seeing some of that starting to happen already but you're talking about the demand for different types of 
different type of setup in, in higher education. Um, because again, I mean, I think, you know, there are a lot of people that are becoming aware of like, okay, yes, I realize I need to, there's certain things I need to know about if I want to be in this field or whatever, but there's also ways to do this where it's more um, learner-centered, learner-directed. And I would also say it's interesting having helped, you know, students apply for college and Mm -hmm. colleges Mm -hmm. look for self-direction. Like it's it's really (laughs) interesting, right? It's like, it's almost like, (laughs) like Jerry said, those two ideas sometimes don't play well together, but they look for, you know, students that are self-directed and, and I, you know, in, in alternatives that I work, we've had colleges that contacted us. Like we want your seat, like, are any of your students interested in us? Like, you know, have, or, Hey, encourage them to at least send in an application, you know, maybe they don't, they won't end up here, but we think your kind of learners would do really well here. And, and so, and, 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 you know, I do haven't done you know college mental health counseling, mental health, uh, sorry, mental health counseling with college students, and they would come to me and I'd be like, "Well, you're kind of in the driver's seat here. You know, you can right. advocate for yourself. You can do that. You know, and and so it's interesting. It's like they. That's why I'm saying I, I colleges look for that because right. you know, let's face it, resource wise, they don't want to have to have students that they need to, you know, have all these resources to support just so they can graduate. Mm -hmm. Right. And Mm -hmm. honestly, it comes down to a financial kind of idea. Like, you know, we don't necessarily want you to use our academic center because now we have to hire two more people because (laughs) all of this, right. Right. And and I I know that's kind of a, a a dark way to look at it kind of, but it, but it's a reality, right. 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 So, so they, they, they look for that because they want, you know, self-independence and self-direction and, and, and all of that. So it's really interesting that it's like, there's almost those two competing ideas. Yeah, I think, I think it is. So I went to Reed here in Portland. Um, and it's one of the few university colleges in the world that still has an, you know, base an honor code. In fact, they have no guidelines other than their honor code. So, uh, particularly back in the eighties, which is when I first went there, I ended up going twice. Um, they they there was a that was when um the the drug czar for the country you know held up reed's handbook and harvard's handbook and so you know we got a lot of negative publicity because of attitudes around drugs at the time and the the thing was that that what most schools did as that crackdown sort of it, it was a national phenomenon it was something you know drug war and you know they had a drug czar and things like that but most schools suddenly propagated lots of rules and tried to enforce those rules. And Reed did the opposite. They said, we have an honor principle. We're going to stick in with it. <laughs> um, but that's really where, you know, self-direction was the, at the heart of that is like, be a responsible person. And, and, and so Reed is an exception in that it even now maintains that. Um, but I think that that's where the self-directed education environment is really interesting because they're basically doing the same thing. It, it may not look, it may not be called an honor principle, uh, like at village free school, it's like there's just three fundamental rules and then all, you know, then they make a lot of other things around that. They make a lot of decisions, but you know, it's take care of yourself and others and take care of the stuff that the, you know, the, the school owns. And then remember that your freedom ends where somebody else's begins. Simple principles. But as you mentioned before, because it's based on these fundamental principles, it transforms the school over time because different people show up and they have different needs and they have different requests and different, you know, and that's one thing that has been utterly consistent about, uh, in all my interviews about with these kinds of, with agentic schools is that who's there matters because it changes how the school is moving forward. Um, and so, so that, and that's, you know, one of the things I think is just fundamental to being an agent, supporting the agency of learners and teachers, mm-hmm. staff, or whatever you want to call them, uh, is, is that the, even if it's the same people tomorrow, they're different, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, mm-hmm. it trans, we're humans and we transform over time. And I think that's a valuable feature, not a bug. <laughs> um, and so, and so the, the, that's where I think that this, the, the universities do look for self-direction things that because it, you know the, what they're looking for is somebody who knows themselves well enough to take advantage of what they have to offer 
You could um, also you could al also almost say that the inverse mm. is true of the traditional system. Who's there doesn't matter. It's right, gonna right. be the same system no matter who's there. Well, you, the 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 standardization and, and and that's exactly what a lot of the the that work has done is like even at the university level we're we're all going to have the same requirements you know we're going to have carnegie units we're going to have you know the yeah. the type of standardization was you know just incredible and it, and it it the university system demanded it of the k12 system that's the you know the committee of 10 back in 1890 you know said we want Carnegie units and we want seat time and we want and it demanded those things and then all the high schools just went along with it. Yeah. They're the one, they're the experts. They know, right? But now I think it's it's the the it's it's gonna flip or it has flipped or it's in the process of flipping, where schools with self-directed learners are gonna be making different demands of what higher education needs to be. And higher education's in a very interesting point because of the in, in the US. In particular, costs are super high, you know, debt, and and so people are rethinking. Like, wait a minute, <laughs> um, and 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 schools are crashing at the lower end. Like we had Merrillhurst University here, and in, in just down the street here, uh, flopped a few years ago. And I think that there's, and we had another one too. But but there's a whole bunch of things that things are transforming, and it's not quite as neat as like the release of an iPhone and suddenly everything changes. Um, I, I think it's it's what we're doing in terms of what I call agentic schools, democratic schools, learner-centered, learner-directed, is that that is on the rise. Um, it, it, I wouldn't say it's commanding force yet, um, but I think it's going in the direction that, that is necessary. Um, and it's going well, it's, to change it's, everything. It's interesting that I, we keep reporting stuff the government sends us about how a lot of people, kids didn't go back to school That's right. and kind of going right along with that, the homeschooling doubled or tripled. Right. Yeah, and and um, and, and the the other data is that uh, they didn't go to private schools. The, the the traditional private schools grew a little bit, but not nearly as much as homeschooling. So so right. it, they they left and they went into micro schools, homeschools. Um, right you know, categories that didn't exist before in some cases, like the micro schools. Um, and, 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 you know, the data is all messy anyway, because, because it's so hard to nail down where any given, you know, like, like where'd they end up. Um, and so, so, so if you have all the, the boundaries are all blended so much that if you ask a parent, are, you know, is it a private school? Is it, is it a public school? Well, is it charter school? Is it, they may not even know what category to put themselves into. <laughs> uh, so it, that that's one thing I noticed. Um, so so is there a sense that 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 of an influence going from self-directed learner centered into the system in a larger sense? Like, do do you see any uh, signs of hope for the system? In, in terms of kind of government funded and, and private bigger schools, do you see influence there? Well, yeah, as, I, as we've been saying, yes, we do see these changes taking place, not as fast as we would like, Yeah, yeah. but they, they are taking place. People are observing them. And uh, it, uh, you'll see, I think over a period of time, some really big changes to, uh, happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and anything you can see like the individual states you know, here in the United States are adopting certain policies. Now, right. they vary, um, you know, everything from universal school choice. But even with that, there's certain things you have to do in order to even plug into that. Right. So right. so I think there's there's movement. You know, we've all been saying it's going to happen maybe slower than we want it to. Um, there's good movement, but also for me, I just feel like there's still that kind of idea of we have to regulate the right. And right, it's like, right. and, and so it's, I, I don't know, maybe that's going to all, all of a sudden change really quickly and it's going to be less regulated. But I think there's, you know, there's states like where I live now, New Hampshire, you know, very mm. friendly to, um, you know, educational alternatives and has, you know, ESAs and things that students can plug into, but you have to qualify for it, right? You don't right. just get it. So, so there's things like that. And I think other states have similar kinds of things, you know, Florida, again, universal ch school choice, but there are certain things that you have to do in order to, 
to be able to utilize that. Right. right so, right. so it's not just a money follows the kid. Hey, go do what you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of idea that that isn't there yet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's involved with alternatives that were a part of our system. I've always been skeptical when there was state or federal or even foundation money available that they would want to dictate that you do it in a certain way. But right, right. Anyway, I want to remind people. So our website is educationrevolution.org. Yep. And you can write to us from there. And so you can uh, get the free new newsletter, the free e-newsletter, weekly e-newsletter from yep. there and find out what's going on. Yep. Great. Great. Right. Let, let's let's finish how we began. So have you each tell a story because, I, you know, storytelling is really important. Um, tell a story of of um, and, and this could be at the school level or at the learner level. Um, uh, someone who really faced a challenge, overcame it and was better for it or the school was better for it. It reminds me of one story that's a little surprising where a kid once told me that he really didn't want to go mm. to a school in which the, the teachers were all very nice and very friendly and, uh, and they would offer classes that were fun and so on, but that they controlled the curriculum mm. uh, and that they decided what you were going to learn. He said, I'd rather know who my enemies are I'd rather go to a to a military school. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. Um, I would say, I mean, uh, uh, I can think of a particular um, student that I worked with who had a very difficult time transitioning to a learner directed um, education. You mm -hmm. know, and just it, it was difficult, and I think it it. it and it, it often does, you know, it takes a while to kind of almost unschool in a way, yeah. you know, because we're so conditioned to for certain things. And and I think the, the difficulty for this particular person was not so much that they didn't believe that people should be able to do that or, or mm. it was more about. So what so once I do that, right, once I kind of buy in and once I'm off and running. That means I have all these options. Mm. What do I do with that? And it took, and, and eventually, eventually over, it was probably two years, mm. um, eventually realized that that was part of the process. That kind of like trying some things out. Hey, yeah, I kind of like that, but you know, that's not really my thing, but it's, all, that was okay. And, and, you know, and trying that to the point where then you, you kind of dial in on maybe, you know, three, five things, I don't know, mm. that you're really interested in and you really want to pursue. And I think that when I saw that transition, but during that time, it was, it wasn't easy because uh, there was a lot of self-doubt, I think. Right. There was, yeah. there was also, again, you know, the, there was a lot of community support for this person, but I think there wasn't so much support outside of the school. Mm. And I think there was some pressures coming from outside of the school community mm -hmm. that was affecting kind of how, well, I should be doing, you know, everybody yeah, else yeah. my age is doing all this. I should be doing it, you know, and it's like, so that was, but eventually, you know, came out really well on the other end of that, mm -hmm. you know, has their own business, how, you know, nice. uh, actually I think might even be I'm trying to think um, might even have multiple businesses i think mm. or it might be one that has like kind of offshoots of it um but anyway you know um went to university for a couple of years kind of mm -hmm. learned what they wanted to learn in terms of the business idea and, and i think came away with a associate's degree or something um but did you know it's fine I and mean, it is a, a, a well-functioning person right now and it's yeah. you know yeah. um so so i you know i love those stories um mm -hmm. but again mm -hmm. you know being in it for while you're in it, sometimes it's hard to see that, you know, see yeah. the end game there. Yeah, and that's been a consistent story uh, of of transition. Uh, homeschoolers talk about it a lot. Uh, Grace Llewellyn talks about the the that transition of kind of de-schooling, I think is what somebody called it at one point. Uh, but yeah, it's a really rough time when you sort of, if you, especially when, as they've, if they've grown up in the traditional system and they're trying to make a transition to either homeschooling or unschooling or, or democratic schools, um, 
to really kind of decompress and and reshape their idea of like who I am and what am I doing. Um, so yeah, that, that that's a a common theme uh, of challenge for people. Uh, but yeah, to encourage everyone, it does work out. <laughs> it may yes. take time and it's hard, but yeah. uh, ultimately it is worth it. I want to thank you both uh, for your time for for joining us. Um, I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate the work you do. Uh, once again, at is educationrevolution.org, um, and Peter and Jerry are always willing to to be available in one way or another. So thank you again, and take Thanks care. Thanks very much, Don, for having us on. All right. This has been the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I would love to hear from you. Please share what resonates with you from this episode. What do you think about schools that support children to exercise their agency on a daily basis? Agentic schools operate from within a new education paradigm. I wrote the Agentic Schools Manifesto to help you make sense of that new paradigm. The manifesto is available as a membership benefit when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more. This vodcast is a co-production of Attituder Media and Deeper Learning Advocates. At Deeper Learning Advocates, we seek to embed the psychology of learning in policy so that policy stops undermining learning. The financial support of our audience is crucial to accomplishing that mission. You can find out more about the manifesto and join the cause at dladvocates.org. One final thing, I also offer a free course called Motivation Myth Busting for School Teachers. To sign up, visit holisticequity.org. Go to the Tools tab and click on Free Motivation Course. Thank you for your kind attention.